Huweda Ara is a Palestinian American attorney and human rights activist. She received her bachelor's degrees from the University of Michigan and her Juris Doctor from the American University of Washington College of Law, where she focused her studies on international human rights and humanitarian law. Over the past two decades, Huweda has been involved in a number of legal and grassroots initiatives for Palestinian rights. In 2001, she co-founded the International Solidarity Movement, ISM, a Palestinian-led non-violent resistance movement, which has twice been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. From 2007 to 2008, Huweda helped build the first accredited clinical legal education program in the Arab world, based at Al-Quds University. She was one of the initiators and organizers of the first delegation of lawyers to enter Gaza following Operation Cast Lead in 2008 and 2009. And she co-authored the report on their findings called Onslaught, Israel's Attack on Gaza and the Rule of Law. Huweda is the former chairperson of the Free Gaza Movement and from August to December 2008, she led five successful sea voyages to the Gaza Strip to confront and challenge Israel's illegal blockade on the two million Palestinians living there. She was, yes. she was one of the primary organizers of the Gaza Freedom Flotilla and was traveling with it when it was legally attacked by Israeli forces on May 31, 2010. In 2011, she was one of the six Palestinian freedom riders who, inspired by the U.S. Civil Rights Movement's freedom rides of the 1960s, attempted to ride segregated Israeli settler public transport, for which they were harassed, then violently arrested. She is co-editor of the book, Peace Under Fire, Israel, Palestine, and the International Solidarity Movement, and her writings have been published in books, magazines, and journals around the world. She currently practices civil rights law in Detroit. I want to briefly share our personal connection. In 2003, after word came to us of Rachel's killing in Gaza, within the next day or so, uh, Huweda and her husband Adam Shapiro, who is also with us, I think he's uh, with his son DR right now, um, they came to see us at our, our son's house in Washington, D.C. So our connection goes back this 15 years as well. In uh, March, uh, later that week, 2003, I can still picture Huweda standing uh, at the Cannon office building on the side when we did a press conference. I'm sure she was wondering, what are these people going to say? <laughs> And I should point out, he had to leave, but Congressman Brian Baird was here earlier. And he was our congressman uh, at the time. And uh, also ended up, before he left office, in making four trips to Gaza and took other members of Congress there. Craig thinks maybe five trips. Uh, so there are some people. We were very lucky that Brian Baird was our member of Congress. Uh, he stood with us. I'm sorry he isn't here. But he was um, Huweda supported our first trip to the West Bank and, and to Gaza, to Israel in 2003. She spoke at our PeaceWorks conference in 2006. Um, I've seen this woman in action in Belain, a village in the West Bank. She, I think her task was to make sure nothing happened to Craig and me. She stuffed us into a car at one point, and then later she came back with a bandage wrapped around her head, bleeding because things do happen there. And I don't know if she remembers that. But it's, uh, she, this is an amazing person. I am so happy that she's here to speak with you today. Please welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. wonderful to be here today, and, and as I said last night, I, um, I don't have the talent, the skills, the words to articulate what a great honor it is for me and my family to be here, because there is no shortage of people, of personalities that would 
I have come and, and spoken here at this 15 year remembrance of Rachel Corey and her work and the impact that she has had on Palestinians, I, on the Palestinian struggle and I think the world. So when I was uh, invited by the Rachel Corey Foundation to come, it was a, an immediate yes and I was just looking for ways to bring my whole family so that you know, now my main job is raising the next generation of, of Palestinians, and of course, I always want my kids to, to meet the wonderful people that I've been meeting and to know about what's happening in the world. Although sometimes I think, like, maybe I should leave them with a little time of this innocence of childhood that, uh, that they should have, and then I, I think no. I, I was talking to someone about it last night. I said, maybe I expose them to too much and then he said something that made me feel a little bit better. He said, well, at least they won't have that one point where their innocence is shattered. And I said, yeah, I guess, okay, that's right. <laughs> so, so they know about Palestine, they know Palestine is occupied, they know something that's very bad that's happening. And, and Mayad always says, Mama, we have to protest very, very hard. And I said, we do have to protest very, very hard. But it is an honor for me to be here. And as Cindy mentioned, our connection goes back a long time. Um, I was actually in Boston, not in Palestine, when on March 16, 2003, I was speaking uh, at a few events there. And my phone was ringing during a, a meeting that I was having. I wasn't answering it, but when I finally answered it, it was a journalist that seemed so relieved that he had gotten a hold of me, saying, I'm, I'm so glad you answered. It's not you. And I said, what are, you, what are you talking about? And he said, well, coming across the feed right now is news that an American peace activist has just been killed in Gaza. And I, I was stunned and said, who is it? Um, he didn't know at the time, but he called it back a few minutes later when the name came across the feed, at the feed. And it was Rachel Corey, who I didn't know very well. I had met briefly during our training, and I'll talk a little bit about the ISM, but by the time Rachel came to join us, we had kind of changed the way the ISM was operating, and I only had the honor of meeting her very briefly during the training we had, and then she went to Gaza, and I couldn't go to Gaza because I have Israeli <coughs> citizenship. Um, but activists were writing, we asked them to write of their experience, and at the time I was taking their writings and, um, and compiling them and sending them out. And a lot of times we would tell actors, just do not exaggerate. Write what you see, write what, you know, the situation's bad enough, you don't have to exaggerate, make it come personal. And I think Rachel was one of the only person who was writing at the time that you didn't have to try to edit her, the, the impact of her words which you heard some of today, and it's really hard for me to follow because I was just reading, rereading them yesterday and, and was crying and didn't think that there was anything I could say that could elaborate uh, on, on the wisdom and the compassion that she shared. But I knew her more through her words, and then I got to meet her family. And so when I was told that, you know, the journalist was saying, it's not you, I felt, of course, that it should be. You know, here I was as a Palestinian and through part, taking part in starting the International Solidarity Movement. We were calling people from all over the world to come stand with us. You know, we have this notion that there was, um, you know, an international privilege that Palestinians didn't have because Israel has succeeded in dehumanizing Palestinians and they could kill with impunity. And that has been clear; it's still clear that they killed Palestinians with immunity. But we were believed at the time that internationals did not you know, have that uh, dehumanization that has come upon them, because Israel would suffer certain consequences uh, that they don't suffer when they are Palestinians. And that, that was shattered, but the, this feeling of immense responsibility in that I had been part of calling Rachel over, um, and so it should have been me and not her under that bulldozer. And then it, we went to see um, her family, Craig and Cindy, and we met Chris also and his family at the time. And I was really scared. What am I going to say to her parents? Um, but we went and I was left speechless by this family that was so devastated, of course, but looking for understanding. Looking now what they could do and what their next steps had to be. 
and not upset at me at all, um, embracing me. And as if they come to embrace uh, all Palestinians and the struggle, which in some ways not their personal, well, maybe it is now their personal struggle. I mean, in a broader sense, it's all of our struggle because wherever there is injustice, you know, I think that we should stand together. Our futures are all interconnected. But maybe that's easier for me to say uh, as a Palestinian. What I mean to say in all of this is that I have never, I didn't expect, and I'm still floored by the dignity with which this family has taken. <laughs> has taken what has happened and turned it into something so powerful. And it's not easy, from as we mentioned, from representatives that have turned their back on them, from the US government that has done nothing to get justice for Rachel Corey, to the struggle in the Israeli court systems, and the final, you know, Israeli court saying that the Israeli military and government are not at fault at all for what happened. And then, you know, the hate mail that you get, and, and having plays about Rachel canceled, and taking that all with stride, and moving forward and not giving up. When sometimes I think all of us um, who have been in the struggle for a long time, some of us who are Palestinians or even not Palestinians and working on other issues, we get tired and you can get frustrated. Um, and then they go on. And Rachel's words about strengthening each other, I think that is so important. We should all reread that when we can. But I was asked to talk about the ISM, and so I want to do that a little bit by telling you how I came into it. Um, you know, I was born and raised in the United States. And my parents left Palestine when my mom was eight months pregnant with me, and I'm the oldest of five children. Because they wanted, and I guess I understand it now having kids, you want to give your children opportunity or do the best that you can for them. Sometimes I find myself angry at my parents because they left Palestine, and in my sense, a, I believe they turned their back on Palestine, which they can't do. But again, I also, I understand it. So I was born here, uh, raised with freedoms and opportunity that I wouldn't have if I was born in, uh, in Palestine. Or you know, even in what's now Israel, because I mentioned that I'm an Israeli citizen. I'm an Israeli citizen, but of course that's almost like a piece of paper that allows me some things, like it has allowed me to, I can still travel back to and get into Palestine, which so many people can't, my husband can't, many people that support Palestinian right can't, and millions of Palestinians around the world can't. But I'm not an equal citizen in any way, and Israel certainly has been trying to uh, push us out, but that's uh, for another, uh, maybe for a topic for another time. Um, I went back to, well, when we were younger, my dad always tried to take us back to Palestine every summer or so, so we would have a connection with the people in the land. And that stopped, our last trip back was in 1986, as a family. And I didn't understand it back then, but I understood what trouble we had. I was old enough at the time to know what harassment and humiliation we were put through when even the kids, I mean, we were separated, we were strip searched, we were held and searched for so long, the plane took off without us, uh, that my father didn't want to go back after that. And as I got older, I started going by myself, but my father wouldn't go back. And in 1999, about my aunts and uncles were communicating with my dad that his father, my last living grandparent, was really sick and my dad should try to come see him before he passed and he wouldn't go. Uh, his next trip back was in January of 2000 to attend his father's funeral. And my grandfather died fighting for his land that was taken away inside what is now Israel to make you know, communities for Jewish immigrants that be, are being brought from all around the world to settle and colonize, not only West Bank, uh, but you know, to continue the colonization of Palestinian land that is now part of Israel. And they continue to do that today with moving to destroy and move out, whole scale move Palestinian populations out of certain communities so that they can build purely Jewish communities. And that goes on today. When I decided to go back a few months after my grandfather's funeral. It was an opportunity to work for an organization that was working on dialogue and peace between Israelis and Jews 
it worked with youth in trying to, you know, the whole concept was let's build a future um, by developing these kids, teaching them to break down stereotypes and, and walls of hatred so that we build a new generation of leaders. So it was all about peace and conflict, dialogue, and resolution. It didn't take long before I resigned from that organization after, after the Palestinian Intifada broke out. At the time, I said, you know, I'm not against dialogue, but the situation is more serious and we have to take action. We have to take it to the streets. It's not just talking. And now I actually am firmly against these kinds of, not against talking to people, of course, but against these organizations that try to frame what is happening as something that we can't get along. It's Jews and Palestinians that just have to learn to get past their stereotypes or the hatred that they're raised with and learn that we're all like, yes, Palestinians, we know that. We know that. But when we were doing these conflict resolution programs, great, these kids would learn that all oh, the other person is just like them, they share the same interests, you know, sometimes they would argue about things. And then when they, our program was done, the Jewish kids would go back to their cities and towns and the Palestinian kids would have to go through checkpoint after checkpoint to their refugee camp under the gun of an Israeli that was probably the brother or sister of the Israeli person they were just sitting with that went back home to his city or town that was most likely built on the ruins of a Palestinian village and nothing was done to address the politics and the injustice of that. And in fact, when the kids were getting together to discuss histories and what happened, you know, in the end, it was like, okay, we can agree to disagree. We can't agree to disagree because we have to recognize the history of the injustice if we're going to work on building a better future because we're in a, a situation where it's not about, you know, just learning to get along. That will come. But it's about active decolonization and rightly a wrong. So when we, um, when the Palestinian, when the second intifada broke out, I took part in these initial demonstrations, and it was about after three or four weeks that the popular demonstrations died down. At the time, I was marching with men and with women and with children, all ages, and we were being met with tanks, armored personnel carriers, snipers, heavily armed soldiers. So within the first month of the Intifada and mainly popular protests, 127, give or take, Palestinians were shot dead. And a report came out that these bullet wounds, 80% of them at least were from, sorry, were from bullet wounds to the head and neck, chest and head area. So this was a shoot to kill policy. And the Intifada became armed after that, which didn't make any sense you know, strategically, but Palestinians wanted to fight in a way. Well, what happened is most in Palestinian society, and our, our children those that didn't have guns, so it sidelined a lot of, of what I believe is our power. And that was my kind of role in thinking behind starting the International Solidarity Movement, is let's try to revitalize. We have a rich history of popular struggle, one that I didn't even know about. You know, I grew up here learning about Martin Luther King and learning about Gandhi and learning about these powerful struggles that I admired in these tactics, and it wasn't until really I went to Palestine and was thinking about, well, how do we, you know, do nonviolent resistance in Palestine that I learned all of these tactics that I admired in other struggles, my own people have been using them for decades. For decades, and the situation has only gotten worse. So the idea of the International Solidarity Movement was to try to globalize the Intifada and give a resource, in a sense, for Palestinians to overcome some of the barriers that, that were standing in the way of achieving certain successes uh, when we were undertaking these tactics alone. A few minutes ago, I got the 10-minute signal, and, um, and there's so much still that I want to say to you, but I'm going to try to summarize by saying the point of the International Solidarity Movement was four things that I think are still relevant today. The first idea strategically was to pro provide protective accompaniment, because Palestinians protesting alone were being shot dead, no accountability. In fact, Palestinians were being blamed for their own death. With internationals in the mix, 
you know, it's not, we felt that the Israeli soldiers would be less likely to use lethal forms of violence. That, you know, hasn't worked 100%, but I think that the situation of Palestinians still protesting without this kind of forceful international presence would be a lot more lethal. Then, to change the way the mainstream media, and everybody reports on what's happening there, as if, again, it, it is this struggle of religion or nationality or this, you know, thousand, two thousand year struggle. And it, it's not. It's not that people can't get along. It's a struggle of freedom versus colonization versus occupation versus oppression. And it's people from all over the world that choose freedom can come and stand with us. And you don't have to, you know, at the time we were calling people to come to Palestine to stand with us. And again, I, and I do think that is important for a certain reason. But I come here and talk to you and people say, what can I do? It's not to say you have to go to Palestine. And when we were running the boats to Gaza, it's not to say that you have to be on a boat. Because really, the most powerful work happens when people come back home, or even people that don't get a chance to go. Those voices there are amplified. People don't look at what's happening on the ground if there isn't a strong support network back home. And so the harder work is done here. And I think Rachel recognized that in her writing. It's not that, you know, oh, I started the International Solidarity Movement. I woke up one day and there was a tank in front of my house with its turret pointing at my window. Like, I do something then. But when you're thousands of miles away and you have, you don't have that, and you have your own struggles, and you have, you know that countless numbers of horrible things are happening around the world, it is all making that time uh, to do this work is not easy. And so the important work is done here, and I think that we should recognize that, and we should let ourselves know and make sure that we feel that what we do, even if it's not always, you know, the, the biggest protest or whatnot, everything that we do in the capacity that we do it is important and is needed. And that is when the internationals go back home also, the ones that join us in Palestine, they engage in that. And now we have thousands of people around the world that have seen with their own eyes that are organizing around the world, I think that are, have been instrumental in some of the BDS campaigns going on, and, and that is critical. And then the fourth thing, which to me is probably one of the most important, it is the morale of the people and the importance of people knowing that, yes, they are under the gun, they are being systematically repressed, and there's an effort to erase them, supported by, well, maybe arguably not the only superpower that exists in the world today, but certainly the biggest <coughs> military and economic might in the world today. And it seems like nobody is speaking up. It seems like they can do this to you and nobody cares. So to have people from around the world come and say that we see you, we hear you, and we care is important for hope. If you want to be able to have hope that we can get by, that it, we can get past this hope to be able to do something, hope is a, an extremely powerful force. And this connection of people helps create or maintain that hope. And a story I tell sometimes, what reinforced that to me is one day before Rachel came, it was in 2002, the Israeli military had re-invaded all Palestinian cities were carrying out military operations, and one of the cities that was undergoing a heavy military operation was Nablus. It was completely surrounded, and the, and the soldiers were inside the city, and they were going house to house by not even going door to door, but because they were in a refugee camp where the houses are close together and separated by a wall, they were detonating holes in the walls of these homes and going and ransacking homes, taking young men, um, and I. We had sent a small group of internationals there. Not that they would be able to do anything, but just to, to witness. So at the time, they were kind of running around where the soldiers were, trying to give them notice that we're watching you, in the hopes that they can reduce the, the violence that the soldiers would use against the civilians. And I was in Jerusalem, not in Nablus, because I was trying to train the new volunteers that were coming, and I got a, a phone call from a man who never really told me what his name was, but he said he lived in Nablus, and he was at home with his family, and the soldiers were going to be coming to him soon enough, and the internationals that we have there are not going to help him and his family, 
than he said. But we see them there. And I just wanted to thank you. And he hung up. You know, and I didn't know his name. But that is the power of people connection. That is the power of solidarity. And Rachel understood that and she shared that. And it is in these times where we feel like we look at what's happening in Palestine today, it looks even worse than it was then. Gaza is worse off now than it was when Rachel was there. Just a few days ago, they had a meeting at the White House called a brainstorming session about what to do with the crisis of Gaza because, you know, the UN said in 2020 it was going to be unlivable, but it is unlivable today. Where over 95% of the water is non potable, where you have electricity at most eight hours a day. I mean, how do you run, how do you run a hospital with electricity less than eight hours a day when you don't even have generators? to power your hospitals anymore. There was a report last month that half the hospitals and clinics are shutting down. So they have to have a brainstorming session about at the White House, as it takes a lot of brains to know that you just have Israel end its siege and systematic oppression of the people of Gaza. Palestinians weren't even involved in that meeting. And yet it goes on, this insidious injustice that we're fighting. Sometimes we feel like it's an uphill battle, but it's a battle that we have to fight because we can't lose it. And I do get torn down sometimes. I don't talk about this a lot, but I think I became clinically depressed at some point that we're not doing enough. I can't do enough. Then I look at my kids and I try to educate them about what's happening. I, it would be, I look at them and I think, I want them to be as, as wise and as loving and as knowledgeable and committed as Rachel Corey. And on the other hand, I'm scared for them and I'm scared for their future. And so it is also from this lens that I am in awe of Cindy and Craig and of what they gave to Palestine and the world. And we move on. And we move forward because we have to. And we see some things in ourselves and in the children, in the new generation, that lets us know we're going to win. And one of these is my kids and taking them to protests and things and trying to explain what's happening. And I'll, I'll end with this. One day I was driving and put on a nationalistic song and explained to them what it means. And my daughter, Mayar, said, asked about why, why did they take our land, Mama? And I said, because they want it to when they push the Palestinians out, but we all have to live together. We have to let the Palestinians also, we have to fight so they can come back. And she said, yeah, we have to fight, Mama. I said, yes, we, yes, we do, Mayasha. We have to put on our superhero costumes and fight them. <laughs> and I said, yes, we do. That's what we're gonna do. And let us all know that we are superheroes in the love that we share and the commitment that we've made to each other and to seeing a better world for the people now, for our future, for these kids, and for our children's children. We have to, sometimes we do hang up our capes, but sometimes we put them back on. And when we put them back on, and we see how many of us there are, we know that it might take a little bit longer but we're going to get there and we're going to win because there is no other choice. And so thank you for being here, for believing, <coughs> for standing with us. And here I am in Seattle and happy to be, but the next time I see you, I hope it's in my homeland of free Palestine where all are welcome.